Hello, back again to discuss our ongoing uh, hexagon of heresy, the um, things that are out of bounds in Orthodox Christology. Uh, we have already looked at um, Ebionism, Docetism, Arianism, and Apollinarianism. In this video, we want to look at both Nestorianism and Monophysitism. Now, I'll briefly define these for us. Uh, Nestorianism is the idea that the natures, the divine and human natures in Jesus, are so separated that they actually form, or at least in function, form two persons. Uh, that 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 the the natures are pulled apart, and the natures act as persons. That's what Nestorianism does. Monophysitism is the opposite error, and it so confuses and changes the uh, the two natures so that they are then one uh, divine human nature and when that happens the divine always swallows up the human so either Jesus has two completely separate and barely intersecting uh, natures or he has one nature that is the fusion of the two and both of these were found to be in error and heresy historically um, but now let's discuss Nestorianism first. In order to, to help discuss Nestorianism itself, I've got to go into a little bit of background. Um, by the 5th century, and Nestorianism did not rise as a, as a problem until the first quarter of the 5th century, by the 420s, um, it had been established that Jesus is fully divine and fully human. And the joining of these two natures in one person is called the hypostatic union. Now the word hypo hypostasis or hypostasis um, is the Greek word that, that gets translated for us person. So in that union of one person there are two natures. Now the natures do not necessarily constitute, the, I'm sorry not necessarily at all, the natures do not constitute the person because we know that the word became flesh. So we have to be on guard against this idea that two natures join together to make a different person. That's not what goes on with Jesus. The person of Jesus is and always has been God the Son. And the, the, he, that person, God the Son, takes on a fully, a fully human nature onto himself. So, Excuse me. Once we have that um, understanding, that's what brings us to the edge of the Nestorian controversy. Uh, but we need one more piece of the puzzle. Closely associated with the doctrine of the hypostatic union is the doctrine of the communicatio idiomatum, or the communication of properties. And what this means is, is that it's how the human being, Jesus Christ, uh, participates in the divine attributes or how God the Son participates in fully human attributes. We see this working in um, uh, even in the text of the New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2 8 where it says they crucified the Lord of Glory. Now the Lord of Glory is, is, is a divine term um, that could just as easily be uh, the uh, one of the divine names of Yahweh, but they crucified the Lord of Glory. They crucified God, is basically what that says. But you can't crucify God because God is divine. You can only crucify a human. So see how the divine takes on the human attribute of um, of mortality. Even though Jesus Christ is fully God, he made himself susceptible to death. And then on the flip side of that is Acts 20:28, 20, where it speaks of the church that God bought with his own blood. Here we have God doing something with his own blood. But God doesn't have blood. Well, he does in Jesus Christ. So here we see the, 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 this communication of properties that the human shares in the divine property of being the Lord of glory, or the divine shares in the human property of having blood. 
And so we see in Jesus Christ one person, but yet that person is share. It, it allows a sharing of of the person exercising either divine or human properties without ever confusing the natures. Jesus remains fully human and fully divine, whether or not he can say, before Abraham was, I am, or on the cross, I thirst. The same I is thirsting or pre-exists Abraham. So, so the I, whenever Jesus speaks, the subject of the I is his person, uh, which is the eternal word of God. But it can also be um, speaking of things that are properly associated with one with with one of his natures. I thirst. God, the divine nature, isn't thirsty. I'll say more about that in a minute because I said that tongue in cheek. But but it is as a human being that Jesus thirsts. But it is as God the Son that he can say before Abraham was, I am. The point is, is that in Jesus Christ, those two aren't in conflict. That, that, that he can say things as God and he can say things as human, but they're not fully as God or as human in Jesus Christ. They are as the incarnate Son of God. They are as the God-man. This will make more sense as we talk more about Nestorianism. Background to the controversy. Nestorius was from Antioch. And as you'll recall from last time, Antioch wants to preserve both the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. Um, he becomes the bishop of Constantinople, which at that time is the capital of the Roman Empire. Um, the city of Constantinople, because it kind of falls under Antioch's jurisdiction, even though it's its own major city, uh, and the school of Antioch were again rivals to Alexandria. And at that time, Alexandria had a very powerful and very malicious bishop uh, named Cyril on, on, on the, as the head of the church at Alexandria. Now, Cyril was a pretty dirty, rotten scoundrel as a human being, but he was an excellent theologian. Sometimes that seems to go together, unfortunately. We, we have lots of dirty, rotten scoundrels in church history that understood who God was. Um, but anyway... One of the things that got under Nestorius, now remember Nestorius is the bishop of Constantinople, one of the things that had gotten under his skin was the popular devotion to Mary. Now we think of that as being a Roman Catholic thing in our 21st century context, but it goes all the way back to the 5th century. And by the 5th century it was very popular, so it goes back even further than that. And this was in Constantinople, so it wasn't in Roman Catholicism. This is in what is now Eastern Orthodoxy. So it was in the Church Universal at the time. Uh, but anyway, uh, Nestorius did not like this devotion to Mary, or at least that she didn't, he didn't like one of the terms that they used. The Greek word was theotokos. What that word means is bearer of God. So in other words, it would be our equivalent to saying mother of God. He, he didn't like that term. He didn't like that... that Jesus was, or I'm sorry, that Mary was called the God-bearer or the mother of God, Theotokos. He thought that was a way too high of a title to give to Mary. He thought she should be called Christotokos, in other words, the bearer of Christ, the mother of Jesus Christ. He could live with that. But Cyril saw his chance. He also saw something very important in the way that Nestorius worded it. He accused, uh, he accused Nestorius of dividing the nature's in Christ to the point that there were two persons. Here is where ne Cyril, even though he was a nasty person, got it right because the, he saw that Nestorius was confusing person and nature. See, here's the simplest way to explain this that I think anybody can understand. Persons do things. Natures don't do anything. Natures just give the person the capacity to be able to do them. Now, let me illustrate this with a simple example in my own life. I'm a full human being. I am not divine. I'm not Jesus. Surprise, surprise. Um, I get thirsty. I get hungry. 
I get tired. Just like Jesus did. <clears throat> I'm a human being. I have limitations on my energy and, and, and on my, uh, you know, once my belly gets empty, I get hungry. Just like you do. But I'm not omnipotent. I'm not omnipresent. I have not existed from eternity past. Why not? Because those are properties that are, 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 are proper to divinity. Those are divine properties. I'm not divine. So I don't have the nature that gives me access to those properties. Jesus, who was both divine and human, had access to those properties. So he could say with human lips and human voice, before Abraham was, I am. And he could also say, as God the Son, I thirst. Or, go to sleep when he's tired. But I can't, I can go to sleep when I'm tired, and I can say I'm thirsty, but I can't say before Abraham was, I am, because I don't predate Abraham. I was born in the 20th century. Uh, so I don't go back that far. That's the difference between person and nature. My human nature gives my person the capacity to do some things. Jesus' human nature and Jesus' divine nature gave him the capacity to do certain things. But the natures themselves are not the subject. The natures themselves are not the actor. It is the person who is the actor. It is the person who does things. The nature just guarantees the person to be able to do them. That's what Cyril saw. Now, I hope you can follow along his logic here. If, if Mary is not the mother of God, then whose mother is she? Now, here in, in the, in the, when we speak of mother of God or bearer of God, neither Cyril nor Nestorius nor anybody back in that time thought or gave, gave an ounce of thought to the idea that Mary had anything to do with the origin of the Godhead. That's just silly. Even, even our modern Roman Catholics don't think that way. They understand that God is eternal and Mary's not. They understand that. What they say when they say mother of God or bearer of God is that she is the mother of God. She is his mother as he is incarnate. Because if she's not the mother of God, then she's the mother only to the human. And, 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 and that breaks apart that union of the divine and the human in Jesus Christ. That's what Cyril saw so plainly. Um, Nestorius was confusing person and nature. He was making the nature subjects. Nestorius was fine by saying that Mary was Jesus' human mother, and so would we be. But he, she's not only Jesus' human mother, she's the mother of the entire person of the Godhead. Because that entire person took on flesh. So she's the mother of the divine I am while she bears him for nine months. And then after he is born and grows up. She had nothing to do with the, his divine origin, of course. But she's still his mother. And, and that's where Cyril jumps on Nestorius. The Council of Ephesus in 431 endorsed Cyril, condemned Nestorius. Nestorius maintained until he died that he had been misunderstood. And he even affirmed the pronouncement of the council later, uh, which is fine. But the council wound up condemning the heresy that bears his name, whether he taught it or not. So the question is, is Mary the mother of God? Sure she is. Um, our last uh, border of our, of our hexagon is monophysitism or Eutychianism, named after a, a, a prelate named Eutyches. Uh, it's the confusion of the natures. And, and Eutyches, not surprisingly, was an official in Alexandria. Nestorianism is an Antioch heresy. Monophysitism is an Alexandria one. Um, the exact sequence of events is unclear even today. Um, we're not really sure exactly how this all came about. But it seems as though Eudekes himself just, just wasn't very smart. Um, he was in way over his head with the people he was dealing with. And, and, and 
he wasn't smart enough to back himself up. He taught that there was only one nature in Christ, this smushed together divine and human nature. It was a blend of the two. And of course, when they're blended, the divine always has the upper hand. Um, Eutychianism, monophysitism, the word monophysitism comes from the combination of two Greek words, mono meaning one, and physis meaning nature. So it's a one nature heresy. Um, this led to the Council of Chalcedon in 451, where Eutychianism, also called monophysitism, was condemned as heresy. And I think that the council uh, put this in language that is really good for us to be able to contemplate. Um, and the council did something else that I think is a model of good theology, uh, no matter how we slice it or dice it. Again, we don't know exactly what it means for Jesus to, to be divine and human at the same time. That's a mystery. I mean, we can, we can say some things about it, but we can't fully and precisely define it. It, it remains over our heads. Um, but what we can say is what this relationship is not. You know, it is not Ebionite. It is not Docetic. It is not Arian. It is not Apollinarian. It is not Nestorian. It is not Monophysite. Those six heresies form the border of orthodoxy. So if you would just sit down with a piece of paper and draw a hexagon, uh, e each one of those lines represents a border of a heresy. But inside the hexagon, inside that six-sided figure, the truth lies somewhere inside it. Exactly where? We're not sure. We're not exactly sure what it means, but we know when we've gone too far and we know when we've crossed the boundary and, and the faith begins to collapse. So, where inside the hexagon the real pinpointed truth of Jesus' div divinity and humanity coming together lies is a mystery to us. But, it's still somewhere inside the hexagon. And, and I think that's very instructive. Because a lot of our doctrines are that way. A lot of our theological reflection can get us within, within some boundaries, but it can't pinpoint. And, and what we have to be able to do as, as Christians and thinkers is say, that's okay. We have to be okay with not being able to, to formulate a precise answer. But we can narrow the boundaries as much as we can, get as close as we can, and say, okay, it's somewhere within this range. Is the exact is the exact idea, and as long as you're within this range, you're good. And that's really what the Council of Chalcedon was able to do. Um, the Council did not make an exact pronouncement concerning the relationship of the two natures in the hypostatic union. Instead, the Council created a boundary of orthodoxy. They created this hexagon of heresy. And, and let me read the Chalcedonian formula to you. Jesus is very man of very man means he's fully human and completely human, and very God of very God, which means he is fully and completely divine. Jesus is two natures in one person, without change, without confusion. Now those two are against monophysitism, because monophysitism changed and confused the natures, without division and without separation. That excludes Nestorianism. So the full thing, Jesus is very man of very man, and very God of very God, Jesus is two natures in one person without change, without confusion, without division, and without separation. Excludes all four of the more pernicious heresies. Arianism, Apollinarianism, Nestorianism, and uh, Monophysitism. It was accepted almost universally throughout the Christian church, although the Coptic Church of Egypt did not accept the formula. They remain monophysite even to this day. Um, but almost universally, the church recognized the Chalcedonian formula. The Chalcedonian formula has come under fire in the modern era because it does not make that official and pinpointed pronouncement of, of where <clears throat> the, the absolute truth of divinity and humanity together lie. And that wasn't its intention, and I don't believe it can. So that's the hexagon of heresy. We'll be back next time with how 
uh, the Reformation deals with the um, Christology. You might be surprised to learn some things there because there's a uh, that's why we have denominations is Christology. So, having said that, have a great day. We'll talk to you later.